guys and welcome to Hada Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about a very interesting pathology and that is portal hypertension. So let's get started. So what is portal hypertension? Portal hypertension occurs when there is an increase in the blood pressure within the portal venous system. Veins which come from the stomach, intestine, spleen and pancreas merge into the portal vein which then branches into smaller vessels and travels throughout the liver. If the vessels in the liver are blocked due to liver damage, blood cannot flow properly through the liver. Because of this, a high pressure in the portal system develops. So all that fancy explanation really means is, is that portal hypertension means there is an increase in the tension of blood within this portal vein. So the portal vein is important and it is formed by various branches so a branch from the splenic vein, from the inferior mesenteric vein, the superior mesenteric vein, and they all drain the intestine, spleen, stomach, pancreas, etc. All of these merge to form the portal vein, which then branches into the liver and is filtered out by the liver. But when we have a patient who has vessels within the liver, which block the flow of blood from the portal venous system into the liver, then we will have a portal hypertension. If there's a difficulty in this blood flowing into the liver, it's going to cause the blood to pool here and sort of backflow into all these systems. So when we have portal hypertension, we will also have to have something within the liver that is causing these vessels within the liver to become blocked. So usually we have a long-standing hepatitis or liver cirrhosis or cancer in the liver or even a thrombus within here. Anything that could block the flow of blood into the liver. So if this liver is inflamed or infected or has a tumor growing within it, it's going to cause a great difficulty of the blood within these vessels to flow smoothly into the liver. So what actually happens to that blood is it starts to pool and it starts to backflow and starts to dilate within all these different systems. The blood can't go forward, it will eventually start to push backwards. So these are the vessels that will all dilate and get fat and fragile over time. So what are the causes of portal hypertension? So as I mentioned in the previous slide, there has to be some sort of problem within the liver that causes this flow to become obstructed. So if the liver is sick in some way, it's going to prevent that blood from passing smoothly into its various channels. So the most common cause of portal hypertension is liver cirrhosis. So if we have a very cirrhotic or fibrotic liver, it's going to cause a great difficulty in that blood to flow. So we're going to, it's going to cause a portal hypertension. So other causes of portal hypertension may include hepatitis, which is the inflammation of the liver, liver cancer, if we have a large tumor growing here, it's also going to obstruct the flow of blood. Also patients who are chronic alcohol abusers. We can also have a blood clot within the portal venous system. So if we have a clot here, of course, their blood won't be able to flow and it's going to start to backflow and pool within these other vessels. We can also have a parasitic infection within the liver and the parasites actually occlude these vessels and will cause a backflow of blood. And also patients who suffer from HIV and AIDS may also suffer from a portal hypertension. So what are some signs and symptoms of portal hypertension? So these patients may suffer from ascites, which is the fluid buildup in the peritoneal cavity. So eventually when these vessels become so full of fluid, they will spill out into the peritoneal cavity and we will have a buildup of fluid in the peritoneal cavity and this is called ascites. The abdomen will also become enlarged and this will cause pain and tenderness for the patient. There will also be an increase in the spleen size which is called splenomegaly which may essentially lead to a low platelet count which is called thrombocytopenia. So if the splenic vein also has this backflow of blood coming into the spleen, the spleen is going to start to enlarge because it's going to be continuously pumped with blood. And when that spleen starts to enlarge, it starts to hyperfunction. And one of the functions of the spleen is to reduce the platelet count of the body. So that's why these patients will have a thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count. If that spleen starts to overfunction, it's going to start to destroy a lot of platelets in the blood and the patient will suffer a thrombocytopenia. So also part of this collateral circulation or this pooling of blood, we will have the anorectal varices which will be present. So these will cause hemorrhoids for the patient. So the vessels all the way down to the anal canal will become pooled with blood 
and these vessels will become very tender and fragile and essentially break, so the patient will suffer from hemorrhoids. The patient will also experience swollen veins in the esophagus, and this is called esophageal varices, and these can bleed and cause the vomiting of fresh blood, which is called hematemesis. So all the blood found within the esophageal wall will also start to pool with blood, and this will actually start bleeding into the esophagus. So the patient will start to vomit fresh blood and may also experience very dark stools, and that is called melena. The patient will also experience swollen veins on the anterior abdominal wall, and this is sometimes referred to as carpet medusae, and these show the presence of collateral circulation. So again, the surface of the abdominal wall will have like these channels which can be visible on the surface of the stomach or the tummy, and these are called carpet medusae. So how can one go about diagnosing a portal hypertension? So of course we will have to evaluate the medical history of the patient. Do they have any associated liver disease, thrombuses in their portal venous system, or a history of a parasitic infection? We can also do a physical examination, which will show signs of ascites, that pooling of fluid in the abdomen, an enlarged abdomen. Do they have rectal hemorrhoids or bleeding from the rectal region? Do they have carpet medusae, which is those dilated vessels over the abdominal wall? And do they have a pato or splenomegaly, which will be noted as a mass as you palpate the patient? The blood test can also help us because if the patient has a liver disease, we will have an increase in those liver enzymes such as ALT, AST, and ALP. We will also have increases in bilirubin. So the blood test will be a very important marker to show us signs of liver disease. We can also check the albumin levels, usually in patients who have ongoing hepatic disease, we have low amounts of albumin because albumin is a protein that is made by the liver. So if we have hypoalbuminemia, which is a low level of albumin in the blood, we know that we have some sort of liver pathology. We can also check the hepatic and viral hepatitis serologies. So if the patient has a hepatitis due to a virus such as hepatitis A or B or C or D or even E, we will be able to pick this up in the viral serology. We can also do an ultrasound of the liver. The ultrasound can show us cirrhosis, hepatitis, any form of cancer, any clot within the hepatic portal system, etc. The endoscopy can also help us to assess the esophageal varices. And as we see in this image on my left bottom side of the screen, all these large vessels, our esophagus is usually smooth. But when we have this sausage-like figures that form within the walls of the esophagus, then we know we have the presence of esophageal varices. These are actually the dilated venous vessels found in the esophagus wall. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of portal hypertension. So we can do an endoscopic therapy to treat the varicell bleeding. And here we can use banding or sclerotherapy. So this is actually an image of what banding looks like. We insert the endoscope with a band and we actually suction up the esophageal varus that we are trying to band. And then we put around it a band which will actually prevent that virus from bleeding. We can also use non-selective beta blockers such as nadelolol or propranolol and this will reduce the pressure in the viruses therefore reduce the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding. We can also use lactulose and this can help treat confusion and encephalopathy because these patients usually have long-standing liver disease they also suffer from high amounts of bilirubin and they will suffer from encephalopathy. So these patients can be treated with lactulose for the encephalopathy. We can also instruct the patient to follow a low sodium diet and we can also give them diuretics to treat the ascites. We can also do portosystemic shunts and in patients with severe liver disease, a liver transplantation will be the choice of treatment. And that brings us to the end of this quick video on portal hypertension. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very easy to understand and interesting. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. And don't forget to turn on your bell notifications so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. If you'd like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.